I try to approach all the instruments at least conceptually the same, which means if I'm playing mallets, you know, I want the sound to come. Nice full stroke, you know, sound out of the bar. Same with when we talk about snare drum here. You guys, we talked a little bit about tambourine the other day. We'll talk more about that. You know, I'm never, not, I can't use the word never. 99.8% of the time, I'm lifting off of the instruments. Like I said, what, marimba and timpani are sort of the obvious ones. You know, you don't go, or, of course, like that. But these are a little less obvious. You know, I found over the years, you know, just even from videotaping and recording myself, you can get a hugely different sound from this or that. So, welcome this morning. We are here at Purchase College. This is the National Youth Orchestra II percussion section this morning, and we're here to do a percussion master class. My name is Jacob Nisley. I am the principal percussionist of the San Francisco Symphony and the director of percussion studies at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Here today, we're going to cover a variety of, of instruments in the percussion section. Uh, there are far too many to cover in the short amount of time that we have here. But today, we're going to start with Samuel here, his first year, well, NYO2 on the snare drum, and I believe we're going to look at Sergei Prokofiev's Lieutenant Kiji Suite, right? Yes. So, take it away. Good. You're brave for starting with that. That is, uh, that is not one of the easier pieces of repertoire mm -hmm. that we have on snare drums. So, a lot to unpack here in just these few measures of music mm -hmm. here. So, you, can you tell me, um, what are you thinking about right before you play this? I'm just thinking about keeping a main, you know, maintaining a consistent tempo, because this is almost like a military club march. You know, think about like John Philip Sousa creating the march. This is what, you know, this is what it's kind of like emulating. And, you know, to keep it consistent. And, I mean, that's, it's not just the tempo. It's also, you know, the dynamics. Playing soft snare drum, it's different from playing, you know, a mezzo forte excerpt because, you know, the manifestation of you playing a loud excerpt, it's a lot easier than playing a soft snare drum because especially the fact that you're, you know, Playing in front of a live stream, it, you can get the shakes in your hands, and sure, yeah. it's very hard to get it consistent. That's what I'm thinking about. Well, like I said, you're very brave for taking this on because you know within this, not only like you talked about, this is definitely a military march. Mm -hmm. um, this is the opening of the piece. Does anyone know what instrument this? I'll ask you. Do you know what instrument the snare drum is playing with by the third measure? It's playing with the piccolo. That is correct. Yep. Yeah. So, I'm not a singer. <laughs> um, but as we've talked about, I highly encourage you to sing your snare drum part. Even might sound ridiculous on your own, but even that, you can hear the way I'm inflecting, the way I'm singing it, is going to make it that much more interesting and that much more off the page. So, a few things. I thought your execution of the ornaments. Now, do you guys know what I'm talking about when we say ornaments? This is sort of, you know, this is a two-pronged excerpt because so many people, especially percussionists, get really, really laser-focused only on the execution of the roughs, the flams, the ornaments. So it opens with a four stroke rough, right? Right? Four stroke rough. So already in there, we have a four stroke rough, a three stroke rough, a flam, and an accent. So that is quite a bit of information in four measures of music, six measures of music, four measures of music. Um, 
So the ornaments, I think it's almost a given that those are important and somewhat difficult to achieve, like he said, under pressure, trying to play quietly. Um, but they are not the only thing because the time to me, if we had a hierarchy, let's say, an imaginary abstract hierarchy of what is more important, I think 10 times out of 10, playing this in perfect time is more important. I'm not saying you can just let the ornaments go however they mm -hmm. want to go, but I, I do think, and I hear this a lot, you know, that first four stroke rough is you know, tough for quite a few people to pull off out of thin air. And I think I've heard both ways, I've heard people who nail the beginning, you know, meaning play it perfectly, right. and then sort of are lackadaisical with the rest of the time, and so that's really not acceptable. And I've heard people mm -hmm. who maybe slightly you know, misinterpret the opening rough, but then they play everything else absolutely in time. I would rather hear version two of that. Do you guys understand what we're talking about here? Um, a couple other things about this. Yes, you said it's, it's a soft snare drum excerpt. Um, it is true that di the dynamic is pianissimo. Or, yeah, pianissimo. But first of all, dynamics are always relative to the circumstance in which they're in. So to me, this and the next thing you're about to play, which is the third movement of Scheherazade, are extremely different characters. They both right. fall under the purview of soft snare drum. But to me, Lieutenant Kiji should sound like someone a mile away, just going to town. Really loud, forceful, that energy, but we can barely hear it because they're far away. Right. As opposed to trying to play on eggshells and trying to approach the drum, and just everything must go perfect. So in a way, my mentality, like we talked about a second ago, my mentality when I approach the drum for this is that I'm just gonna let it. I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let. It, I'm gonna play it. If it's a little too loud, I'd rather it come out clean and in time than try to set the world's record for the softest four-stroke rough. Um, unfortunately, you know, for a lot of percussionists who think this way, that alone will not win you the job. You know, mm -hmm. the softest snare drum doesn't win you the job. It's it's become almost an obsession for us, and it's mm -hmm. ac absolutely important. I think it's you know, but to me, like we talked about earlier. The key to getting good on soft snare drum is playing soft snare drum. And that sounds not very intelligent, but what I mean by that is I spend way more time practicing rudimental snare drum etudes or practicing my exercises on soft mm. snare drum so that I don't have to play Kiji over and over again. I don't have to isolate and practice, okay, today I'm practicing four stroke roughs and seven stroke rolls. No, I'm, this is all incorporated in a more holistic way of playing the snare drum, getting good at the snare drum, and you know, quite frankly, if you're playing Will Coxon or Pratt or any rudimental stuff at pianissimo, this should be a piece of cake. You know, one other thing I want to show you before we move on is, can I use your metronome? Um, is uh, the way that I practice this one. So basically, let's get this down. Ooh, it doesn't have it. Um, does anybody have a phone metronome by chance? Could use? That would be nice. What I'm listening for here, so you're right, it's a mel, it's a jump, 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 So I'm assuming you practice it with quarter notes on? Yes. And then I'm assuming, do you, do you ever practice, so I can show you that here. Uh, so let's say I'm going to use, there's no correct tempo for any of these things, but sort of a ballpark tempo, I'll use uh, 126 here. I do not know how to use this. But. All right. So I hope you can hear this. That's 126 beats a minute. So I'm practicing key G1, 2, 3, 4. 2, 3. 2, 3. Another way you can practice is on off beats, right? right. And, 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 and. Right, and so on and so forth. Uh, does anyone have the phone metronome? Could you cue it up to 31 beats a minute? Um, so what I like to do with the metronome, and this is, we're sort of going more into just the snare drum topic here, is I like to use the metronome as a guide, but not a crutch. Meaning, you think about, remember when you first learned how to ride a bicycle, mm -hmm. and you had your training wheels on there, right? I feel like anytime you use a metronome in, in subdivisions of quarter note or higher, Unless you're learning something new, it's not that, 
helpful when you're playing live to have had, you know, or whatever, you know, all of that is great, but honestly, when you get on your own, you have to be able to lay this down just as though that were there. So what I like to do is I use the metronome on whole notes for this one, and I hear it almost like a big fat backbeat, like a drum set player. That somehow disarms me into going playing Kiji rather than thinking, oh God, I have to nail this rough, I have to nail this rough, oh geez. You, know, you talk about shaking. To me, I just think, three, four. hear that? Does that make sense? It's still there, but it's more acting like a guidepost rather than beating you over the head with every single note along the way. Do you want to try the whole thing again? Yes. Do you have any questions? Uh, not at the moment. Okay, let's hear you play it. Much improved. Does anyone, do you guys have any feedback for him? Any thoughts? Did you hear anything? Yes? Um, so I think your time was much better, mm -hmm. was much better in the beginning. Um, it did tend to push forward at the very end, mm -hmm. but your time was still consistently, it was, it was very consistent over the whole thing. Yeah, so Caleb was saying, one of our other students here, that time was much improved here, but this time through, you still felt it was pushing forward, I meaning it sort of had a little bit of a nervous energy. And I can tell you, if you think about a march, they don't really lose time. They don't step you know, out of time there. What I think you can do to help anchor that is after, you, you know, sort of the, the whew moment in this one is you, all the hard stuff's over. Now I can just, and that is generally where I hear people be that lackadaisical sort of like meandering with tempo. So you really have to hold on, and I sort of hear it as, you know, so you're really feeling almost like an anchor drop. Because if you don't think that, you know, it's almost thinking angularly. If you don't think that, it can have the tendency to do what's happening, which is you're getting a little bit into a And so we're sort of clipping, we're losing, truncating, however you want to put it, that fourth beat there, and it kind of throws off the feel a little bit. Uh, in the interest of keeping things moving, we'll come back to this in a little while. Would you like to come up, Angelica, and do some snare stuff also? Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much. Yep. Excellent work. So we're going to kind of keep going in the same direction here. We're talking about snare drum, orchestral snare drum. Uh, Sam was kind enough to play some orchestral repertoire for us. Now Angelica and I are going to back up and sort of zoom out a little bit here and talk about fundamentals and how to practice and sort of her routine on the snare drum too, which is fantastic that someone this young already has a routine on snare drum. I think for any instrument, but especially percussion, because we have such a wide array of instruments, it's really hard to find, get your footing if you're you know, practicing marimba one day and bass drum the next day and timpani for five hours the next day and now I want to play drum set today. Um, granted, it is almost impossible to practice every instrument every day, but I think the way that you make much faster progress and much more efficient progress is by having a routine. What, no, regardless of what it is, it doesn't have to be person A or person B. It, usually it's nice if it's a hybrid of those things. And so um, I'm a huge stickler for efficiency in the practice room. I was never the guy in school or in audition preparation that spent, you know, oh, I just spent 10 hours in the practice room. I just that has never been me, and I, don't, I never really wanted that to be me, because I think if you have efficient, effective ways of practicing, you can cut down on that time, and you can actually 
make yourself that much better. You sort of hold, hold yourself to a higher standard mm -hmm. in that type of practicing. So let's take a peek at what you're doing here. So usually I start off with like stick control. That's like my first thing. And I'll either use a pad, but I'll just take the, top, uh, the snares off for now. Sure, and, I, and a metronome? Yes. So we're talking about, for those of you who don't know, stick control is a, is a book by George Lawrence Stone. It's been around for probably 70 years now. It is sort of the, probably the most universally used application for snare drum. I use it with all of my students. All my teachers used it with me. I think it's, you know, it's pretty much the, the, the building block for all of our snare drumming. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how, how, I'm, what is your uh, goal here with stick control? Well, I try uh, to make sure I'm not accenti accenting at all. I want to have like consistent strokes and like what you were saying earlier about you know, playing with a lift. Mm -hmm. I try to like make sure all my strokes are well lifted and then I'm not using a lot of arm. Mm -hmm. I'm using wrist. I'm like testing with my fingers, kind cool. of experimenting with that. So let's hear you play some. I may, I may stop you, don't, don't be alarmed. But. Okay. So when you start for the day, this, you start with stick control. Yeah. And do you set yourself a specific tempo that you always start at? Um, no, I actually like to switch it up because okay. you don't always play at the same tempo for like or orchestral stuff. So I like to, sometimes I'll play with a metronome, other times I'll put it like on a song and sure. then I'll play it and just like groove to it. Yep. Great. going for even as possible it's sort of I mean you're treating this what it generically is like a warm-up right mm -hmm. and so to me it, there's a certain element of what we do as percussionists that is I don't want to say athletic but it's, it's certainly very physical in nature so I treat stick control like a literal stretch like a warm-up so when I play I play you know as full as I can for this but my goal with stick control is all the way through for every single exercise to sound uniform, to sound the same. If you had your back to me, you would have no idea what number I was on. Um, so this, this goes into my bigger idea of we learn the rules and then we break the rules. So we're not going to play everything we play in music, da 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 and super straight. But if I can have that as home base, if I can say I know I can do that, once again, psychologically, that gives me the comfort to sort of play. I can do, you know, if you have your technique taken care of, so it goes, you're no longer constantly thinking about technique all the time. You can think much more beyond that. Like Don was talking about, you know, you can think much more horizontally with your musical phrasing. So when I play stick control, if I may, I always start at uh, half note equals 50. So I do always do the same tempo because I always want to stop, or I always want to start really slow. So um, this is 50, 100. So. here for our listeners, put a towel on the drum. And I do it the full extent that George says to in the book. So you can see my stick heights are pretty high here. stick control here. Um, my idea, my, my general snare drum stroke, which we haven't really gotten into, I try to incorporate varying proportions of one-third finger, one-third wrist, one-third arm. So the key there is varying proportions. I don't use literally one-third of each all the time. When I say arm, I don't mean I'm playing like this. You know, I'm not. What I mean is if you hear, you know, like, when you get into playing three and four strokes on a hand, or when we get quieter, and we'll come back to this, for something like Scheherazade, 
I use quite a bit of arm. Actually, it's something we didn't talk about. When you're nervous, your big muscles will last a lot longer under pressure than relying on your fingers. When I was much younger, I could get away with playing Scheherazade with my fingers. It sounds I can still do it occasionally here, but I would not bank on 10 out of 10 for that. So even starting with something as, as basic as stick control, all of these principles for me are going to keep adding up, or rather keep being you know, branches off the same tree here. You know, so what I'm doing here with just I want to be able to sort of shift up and down without having to change my, my stroke or my fulcrum, right? For all of that, I'm not changing, oh, now I'm using you know, only fingers or whatever. I, like I said, it's a shifting proportion throughout, but I'm still trying to have my arm be you know, activating it, where I'm playing a roll. Or a little fast for that, but um, you understand what I'm saying? So I have sort of a support. I'm never relying like I only play wrist, you mm -hmm. know. I only play finger, you know, only, only play arm is ridiculous. But um, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So do you want to do a little more stick control now that we have this on here? Uh, I notice you're going, you're retreating back to number one each time as sort of a point of reference. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. The thing about stick control is, is there is no one right way to go through the book. I think there's a lot of different collective uses for it, and this is a great one. So, that's it. It's, it's much fuller now. Uh, you can hear that, I mean, I don't know about you guys. That's why I use the towel. I think you can actually hear timbre change much better. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I were playing, squeezing the stick like they're going to fall out of my hands. Yeah. What does that do to the sound? It's shorter. Shorter, way less tone. Choked is a very good word for it. And look at me. I mean, I'm, I'm moving like, like I'm pushing through you know, a bank of snow or something. It should be, you hear the sound change immediately, you know, part of that is just the stick itself. If you let the stick do what it's supposed to do, you know, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. With metronome on random, uh, you know. As opposed to. Granted, I don't think I've heard anyone try to perform it that way, but you know, it all starts with me at the most fundamental level of sort of getting this all together really slow. If I can make, to me, it's number 14 in stick control that is the ultimate check on this, which is. If I, could, if I feel like I can make that juxtaposition of singles and doubles super even every single time, mm. then I will move the metronome up a little bit faster. But for me, I spent a lot of agonizing hours my first few years in college just on this book, even though I thought at the time, oh, I, know, I can do all this. This is so simple. And I'm forever grateful for that, because that approach, you know, the holistic approach now taken and applied to mallets, applied to timpani, you know, like we said, applied to accessories, you know, that is how you get good at these instruments and do it fast. Maybe not as fast as you'd like in the moment, but overall, long term, a much more efficient way of getting good at these things rather than sort of, okay, now I want to learn velocities and now I want to learn timbre and chinois and I want to learn some Tompkins etudes and, you know, these are all great things, amazing repertoire, but we need to sort of follow a path. We need to make sure we can play a snare drum roll before we're trying to play a Delacruz one, you mm -hmm. know? Um, do you want to play a snare drum roll for us? We can talk about sure, that. Yeah. Uh, do you want to start with a an orchestral role or the rudimental role? Um, we can do the orchestral roles. Like okay. Roles. So I usually um, 
turn on the metronome and I play consistently with like one stroke, one hand. Okay. And then Show I. Show me that. Yeah. So as you guys know, while, while she's setting up here, the orchestral roll, known by names as the buzz roll or the press roll or friction roll or whatever, um, doesn't really matter what you call it. It's, it's a multiple bounce roll is what it is. That's what distinguishes it from our single stroke roll and our double rudimental stroke roll. This is a oftentimes indeterminate amount of, of strokes on each hand. So yeah, show me how you get into it. So I'm going to play forte roll. Nice. Wrong. That's okay. It's hard to hear. Yeah. Um, so, can you take me to the final product again? And can you just hold a long roll for, say, five, ten seconds? Excellent. Yeah, very full, very nice. So, at the risk of being redundant, telling you guys something you already know. The snare drum roll or the timpani roll or any of our rolls in our instruments are meant to be our only valve of sustaining. It's the only way, you know, other instruments can keep blowing, they can put a pedal down, they can keep the bow on there. We don't have that, so this is our version of a, a long sustained note. So to me, when I think of a long sustained note, I think of an operatic singer singing from deep down here, sustaining a note, uh, and not, you know, like, the snare drum, like, you know, like, get in there. Um, so when I think about that, I, my, again, sort of sound philosophy, soundscape for this is a big, it's a full, round sound. You can still, I mean, it's still a drum, so you're still hitting it. But for me, my roll concept comes from the triple bounce roll, if you guys are familiar with that at all. It's not, I'm sure if you broke it down, it was not always uh, precisely three beats, but it's sort of coming from this. <laughs> So with that type of stroke, with that playing, I, as you look, I'm pretty relaxed when I play. I'm not really digging in for it. So, uh, you know, it's definitely an, a more open sound, I think, to play this version of the role. And also, you can see it makes it very easy to decrescendo, too. Um, one of the things I work on all the time with students and myself is really expanding your range on the role. I think so much time and focus gets put on How's my soft roll? How's my soft roll? Let me, let me see how push it softer, push it softer. And you're sort of eking this direction. But like I said, when he opened up, all dynamics are relative. Anything that you do, especially when you're by yourself, is going to be relative to yourself. So if you can push your higher end, you know, even 10% higher, that makes your soft sound that much softer without having to do so much agonizing work and just barely pushing the needle that mm -hmm. direction. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm talking about? Uh, do a rudimental roll. You ever try one of these? Where you go?
What do you think? That's, that's impressive. That's really good. Nice. Um, do you ever practice that? You ever work on that? I do, yeah. Nice. Um, maybe we could do just a little bit of tambourine. We'll come back to some of this stuff if you want to, or should we, what would you guys like us to do? Move on to some, some marimba? You want to play a little marimba for us? Sure. Is that cool? And then we'll come back. We'll hit this. We'll do some timpani, do some tambourine. So what are you playing for us here? Uh, I'm playing White Knuckle Stroll by Casey Cangelosi. Cool. You guys know who Casey Cangelosi is? Um, well, I know that he does the percussion podcast. Like right, yeah, yeah. At percussion, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's one of the superstars in our percussion world now. He's yeah. probably right about my age, but he, I think he teaches in Virginia now, at James Madison. He's, anyway, he's a prolific composer and a uh, brilliant individual. So this is the White Knuckle Stroll, Casey Cangelosi. enthused and moved by this music and you get into it nicely. Um, my one very simple thought that probably these guys would is that I, I think the mallet choice, mm -hmm. which is not usually my first area of concern, but in this one I think, um, what, what do you think I would say about it? In the upper register it didn't really come out, like especially with the doubles. Exactly, yeah. So uh, this is part of what we do as percussionists, we sort of have to, no one tells us exactly what to use, you know, not what pair of cymbals to use, and here not, not what pair of mallets to use, because these sound fantastic in the low range, 
you know, but then they're almost non-existent in the high range, like what you said. It's, it's gonna, you, know, you don't want to use a mallet that's going to actually make you do more work than you necessarily have to do. You want to be able to play with an implement where, again, you're not, you don't have to think about this stuff when you're going. You're able to make music and not think, okay, is this going to be hard enough for Dunner? Maybe I need to really bring this out. No, I mean, so that, that was one area that I thought was a little bit lost. Uh, I also felt like you could play this piece a little more deliberately at times and not feel like you have to jump from every section to every section just because there isn't a rest or it doesn't say breathe. You know, I mean, I think that's percussionists, when we play melodic, well, overtly melodic instruments, when we play Bach on marimba, when we play marimba solos or ragtime, we tend to get caught in the trap of the metronome is still on back there somewhere. You know, you play dun 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 and all of a sudden you're here for the rest of the piece. And it's not to say that Bach can't or shouldn't be mostly in time, but I think not just Bach, but all of this. I think a lot of times percussionists feel like I really have to be beholden to that inner metronome, which most of the time that is true. But I think when we have the opportunity to not do that, you know, when we play in the orchestra, we've talked about this week many times, the difference between metronome time and orchestra time, right? And so orchestra time is adjusting to sort of the currents and the waves of the different pulses that you find throughout. Uh, soloistic time would be maybe a third category, I'd say, for, you know, you hear pianists, or most, any instrument that plays, you, use, you can use more rubato. Do you guys know what that means, rubato? Changing the tempo, slowing down. Yeah, yeah, literally meaning robbed in Italian, like rubato, taking, taking time, giving time. So it's not always just slowing down, sometimes it's pushing forward a little bit, not in Kiji but in other opportunities where you can sort of make the time, the word I would say is elastic, make, make, have some elasticity to your time so music doesn't just sound like a drummer playing, you know, we have to be able to negotiate and then, you know, be able to play still rhythmically but with, you know, a little bit more uh, elasticity, a little bit more push and pull going on there. So does that make sense? I mean, that's almost uh, maddening in a sense. You think you spend half your day playing precisely in time with a metronome, and then oh, it's over here. OK, now, remember what I said there? Forget all that. You know. Mm -hmm. So do you guys have any feedback for her? Yeah, Sam. I think, you know, when you play the melody, the main melody, the da 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 the, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you have flams or if you have... Yeah, double stops. I think, I wouldn't say accident, but just put more emphasis on it to tell the audience that you, these are the ornaments that are included. Mm. And because, you know, uh, I felt like the flams were played as like simultaneous doubles. But like, if you play a flam with more emphasis, I think you can just really, you know, bring out the, you know, besides the melody, any, you know, the miscellaneous information that you're trying to put out. It's just, it's, I mean, that's what's really cool about this solo. It's a lot, it has lots of offer, so just bring it out. It's very virtuosic, you know, I think when you have opportunities to sort of emphasize like what he's saying, so it doesn't just feel like a total blur the whole way through, you know, it's a, it's a ton of notes on marimba. It's very impressive and, you know, from a, a visual standpoint, it's very cool to see someone fly up and down the instrument like that. But don't forget to take some time here so we can, you know, like he's saying, you know, I would, I would, I would say, it, sort of spoon feed this to the audience. Granted, you know, this isn't Bach, so probably you show up and you play this for someone or a room full of people. Probably most people haven't heard it, you know, mm. you know, that will change with time. But so you want to, you want to play it in a way that's obviously appealing, and you know that. What I did like is you, you're, you're your manner or mode of execution was fairly easy. You're fairly relaxed, you know? I mean, I think contrary to maybe some belief in our head, most people want to see it look effortless, you know? I know when I adjudicate auditions, I don't want to see someone who's sweating and, you know, that to me, you know, that means, I would guess that means they're not as comfortable as they could be in playing it, or they're barely holding on for dear life. They just learned it last night and crammed it or something. You know, some, some sort of scenario like that. You want to be up here playing, like, no big deal. It's all good, you know? So that takes a while to arrive there, and I'll revert back. We're going all the way back here. 
this is where when you have your fundamentals taken care of, you literally, you, you are able to see past a whole bunch of different blockades in your way. You're no longer thinking, you know, your mind is not consumed day to day with I've got to be able to do this, I can't quite pull that off. And it's more so like, how could I phrase that? Let me think of nine different ways to phrase this instead of let me think of my stickings or, you know, gosh, I hope you know, if I change that to, you know, those are important things, but I, you know, ideally we are able to move past that when we're playing. So that makes sense? Great, yes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Very good.